It has been, of course, over thousands of years and through the middle of hundreds of civilizations that people have sought ways to memorialize soldiers who fell in their wars. But for us as the American people, the practice comes down from the Civil War. It started informally in the South as ladies groups on their own gathered to decorate the graves of their fallen soldiers. Seeing this, nine southern states made it a formal practice for each of their states on various days in the spring, in the spring so that flowers would be readily available. In uh, 1965, I believe May 1st, just after the surrender of the Confederacy at any rate, a group of newly freed slaves gathered at a racetrack that had been converted into a prison camp where the Confederacy held Union soldiers. And they went and officially consecrated and decorated a cemetery for those Union soldiers who lay nameless in their mass grave, but who had contributed to the freedom these men and women now enjoyed. They referred to them as the martyrs of the racetrack. Just a few years later in 1868, John Logan and Mr. Logan had been a congressman. He resigned his office to go and fight on the Union side, and he came back afterwards to Congress again. A little bit later, he would run for president, and since you don't recall a President Logan, you can probably guess that he was unsuccessful. But he did come back from the war, and he took up his office in Congress again, and inspired by those observances that I have already mentioned, he helped to draft a decree that on the 30th of May, each year, all Americans should remember those who had perished in the recent conflict and decorate their graves. Again, the springtime, because of the availability of flowers, the 30th of May, because that was one of the very few dates that did not mark the anniversary of a major Civil War battle, a victory for one side, a defeat for the other. Those cruel and bitter memories. And so that day was chosen. He called it Decoration Day. It was not until my young teenage years in 1971 that it became a federal holiday with everything that goes along with federal holidays, and the name was changed to Memorial Day. It is natural and appropriate that we should remember those who fell in our wars, and that we should generally remember our loved ones who have preceded us in death. I, I make a point, I try to tell my children and now my grandchildren the stories of my grandparents whom my children knew a little but my grandchildren did not know at all and my great-grandparents whom my children knew not at all and even my one great great grandparent that I had the privilege of knowing as a young child I try to tell their stories to my children and my grandchildren when we took things upon my father's death one of the few things that I brought home was the anvil that belonged to my great grandfather Grandpa Ross. I brought it for the sole reason that my sons had taken up occasional knife-making, forging projects, and I thought how good it would be for them to carry on their work on an anvil that belonged to their great-great-grandfather, and what an opportunity it would be for me to tell again those stories of his life as a blacksmith in our community and the work that he did on his own farm and all of those things. I naturally want the people that I loved 
but who have gone on to be remembered. And I know that the day will come when the names Ross Bailey and Vernon Bailey are forgotten. A generation will arise even in my own family that will not recall those men or their labors or their loves. But I strive to see that that day is put as far into the future as possible by telling again the stories of those godly, hard-working men who came before me. Nobody wants their loved ones to be remembered as old what's their name or whoever she was or just part of a generation of Hoosier farmers that are now long gone. With all that in mind, let me mention a name, and I don't know how many people will remember. How many of you know who Salmon Chase was? Honk your horn if you know. Salmon Chase. Three. Three. Three of us apparently know who Salmon Chase was. If you didn't know, Salmon Chase was the 23rd governor of the state of Ohio. And that is something and worth remembering, but we don't remember it. Salmon Chase was the sixth Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. And that is something worth remembering, but we don't much remember it. The chief work in which he is remembered occurred because he was the 25th Secretary of the Treasury serving in that office under Abraham Lincoln. In that office, it was his job to make sure, at least as sure as he could, that the Union did not go bankrupt because the war would largely be determined on who ran out of money first, whose economy tanked first, who couldn't hold out without further funding. And Sam and Chase worked tirelessly to make sure that the Union was not the one that ran out of money first. You can thank him or criticize him, but it was his idea to take us to a Federal Union Treasury paper currency, greenbacks, demand notes, he called them, because at least in theory you could take them to a bank and claim the amount of gold or silver that the various denominations remembered. That was Sam and Chase's idea and a big help in the time of the Civil War. As a matter of fact, if you'd like to know what the man looked like, his face appears on the $10,000 bill. So just open your wallet and yank out the first $10,000 bill that you see, and there you will find a picture of Sam and Chase. And now that you have it out, set it on the seat beside you. The offering will be taken in the uh, exit when you are ready to leave. But how he appeared, or that his face graced the now defunct $10,000 bill, is still not his legacy. But he did leave behind a legacy that each and every one of you are aware of, though you don't remember his name or the other things that he did. He was chiefly responsible for the fact that since 1864, all United States currency bears these words, in God we trust. The letter that he wrote in 1861 to get the process started, wrote November the 20th, 1861 to James Pollock, director of the Philadelphia Mint, Dear Sir, no nation can be strong except in the strength of the Lord or safe except by his defense. The trust of our people in God should be declared on our national coin. You will cause a device to be prepared without unnecessary delay with a motto expressing in the fewest and tersest words possible this national recognition. And Mr. Pollock did a good job. In God, 
we trust. You know, there's been a lot of battle in recent years to get that off our money. And I'm grateful so far that they have failed. And I am thankful to Sam and Chase that it is there to begin with. That every paper bill, 50 cent piece, quarter, dime, nickel, or penny you and I have ever handled reminds us in God we trust to have and as part of the war effort of the time to have participated so materially in the unfolding of the plan of God as it is made manifest in the course of the histories, the nations, and the cultures of this world. That is legacy enough for any man. For you and I all this time later to recognize that national expression of trust in God on the currency, that is legacy enough for any man. Eric read to you from the book of Genesis, and I haven't gotten to that yet, but I will. Bear with me just a little longer. I'd like to talk about King David for a moment. There is a man who is well remembered, though he lived long before Sam and Chase. We all know who he was, even though we have forgotten Sam and Chase. And David was famous for just reasons. He was the king that put Israel on the map, expanding their borders, making them a respected military power, boosting the economy beyond anything that those before him could have pictured. He did not build the temple, but he conceived it. He designed it. He largely funded it so that when the time come, his son Solomon would be ready to go. And David was a soldier. He started in the ranks and as king became a general, but he was not one of those desk generals. He was a warrior general who personally led and fought alongside his soldiers until that day when in his advanced age, it kind of notes sadly, came the season when the kings went forth to war and David could no longer go. But he gained great fame for his many notable military conquest and for his own particular bravery on the field of battle for all of these things David is remembered perhaps he is remembered even more though for having been the man after God's own heart he got that title because he hated sin even though he was a sinner he hated his own sin, worse than he hated any other sin, and it left him heartbroken, and it marred his life and his family. But despite all the personal cost, at the end, David says to his Lord, against thee and thee alone have I sinned. The man after God's own heart. But even this, I think is not the real root of our memory of David. God made a covenant with him, and the upshot of that covenant is that when Jesus finally came to be the fulfillment of all of God's plans and covenants, he came as the son of David to sit on and renew and restore the throne of David to fulfill the real promises that David nor any other human being ever could fulfill. And David's name is associated in this fashion with the ministry of Jesus. David paved the way for the coming of Jesus. David helped shape the understanding for the comprehension of what Jesus would do when he came. To have participated so materially in the grand unfolding plans of God as they are made manifest in the histories, nations, and cultures of this world. That is memorial enough, legacy enough 
for any man. Similarly, Moses and Abraham, and here I come to the verses that I asked Eric to read today. What is true for Abraham, I believe, is also true for Moses. Both of these men were also soldiers in their own right. Abraham took up the sword and led his small personal force to rescue his nephew Lot when Sodom had been sacked by the confederacy of five kings. Moses, more a general but a director of key battles that took place on the way to the promised land. Both were soldiers. Both were pioneers, settling the infant nation of Israel in a new land and bringing them back to that land as a numerous and established people. Both were defiers of pagan kings. Abraham attained great wealth, and Moses worked great miracles in the name of God. But these are not really the things that have caused these two men to be remembered either. First, these two have attained to this title, friends of God. And that is something to be said about a person. But let's go one step beyond that. God made a covenant with each of them. Abraham and Moses. And he promised in the covenant with Abraham, and I believe it is implicit in the covenant with Moses too, that all the peoples of the earth would be blessed because of the relationship that these men, particularly Abraham, held with God. And God kept that promise because Jesus Christ, who came as the fulfillment of the monarchy of David, came also as the fulfillment of the law given to Moses and of the original promise given to Abraham and in him all the peoples of the earth are blessed. David, Moses, and Abraham labored and through their labors the road was paved that led to Jesus Christ and a nation was prepared to understand him and at least in part to accept him and a world was so ordered for the perfect timing of his divine ministry to have so participated in the unfolding grand plan of God as it was made manifest in the histories, nations, and cultures of the world is legacy enough for any man. And as I have mentioned of these three, they were, each of them, in their own right, soldiers. And I will not say that war in and of itself is righteous or good or holy. I recognize that it is part of the condition of the fallen world, and I look for the fulfillment of the promise in the world to come that swords will be beaten to plowshares and spears and to pruning instruments, and we will study war never again. I know that this is true, and yet God has, in the course of moving his plan forward in this fallen world, world always employed the wars of men, the wars of the Babylonian expansion, the Persian expansion, the Greek conquest, and the Roman Empire are the rivers on which the Old Testament flows into the new. And in our day, the Revolutionary War, are still the river on which the plan of God moves forward. I want you to know that's not a continuing accident back there. That's a prolonged amen, I think. There we go. God still, as long as this fallen creation continues, moves his plans forward through the wars of men. 
soldiers, those who made it through and those who did not, to have participated so signally in the grand unfolding of the plan of God as it is made manifest in the histories, nations, and cultures of this world. That is legacy and memorial enough for any man. We can't do as we would normally do on an observance like this, so let me just try it this way. First, if there are any veterans present, let me hear your car horns, veterans. A few. Now let me hear from the rest of you in appreciation of these few. Amen. I hope that your celebration of Memorial Day is amazing and filled with blessing. And I hope that in the course of it, we do properly remember those who fought, not only for our safety and freedom, but as part of God's ongoing plan and provision for this world, leading to a world where war will be forgotten. When the final battle between God and Satan, that war in which all of our various conflicts are only little episodes, when that final battle has been fought and we live forever at the feet of the Prince of Peace.